As I mentioned in my last video, it's not looking good for WrestleMania 32. It looks like that show has some epic potential to suck big donkey dick. That's the way it is. You look at the current state of the product combined with the fact that it looks like a lot of the big names that you could have involved in the show, like The Rock, Stone Cold, Ronda Rousey, Sting, uh, maybe Batista, uh, and other guys like Randy Orton, Seth Rollins, and Daniel Bryan for different reasons, whether to be injury, other commitments, what have you, not wanting to do it. They're just not going to be involved with the show. You know, on the surface, it looks like none of them are going to be involved in the show at this moment. Which you would have thought for WrestleMania 32, which I was calling in part part-time mania, you would have anticipated and expected most, if not all, of these names to be involved with the show. It looks like the WWE might not have any of them. And when you look at the current state of the WWE product and the lack of potential star power heading into that event, there's not a whole lot of reason for optimism. There just isn't. It's easy to gravitate towards the negativity, as I did in the last video, because there's all types of reasons to be negative about it. Now, in the interest of fairness, though, I don't think all is lost when it comes to WrestleMania 32. Foolishly, or maybe not foolishly, I believe that the WWE still has time to fix it, that the WWE still has time to get on the correct trajectory. I think the WWE has time and still has the resources and tools available to them to be able to make WrestleMania 32 a memorable show. Now, that is in no way saying that they're going to, and that is in no way saying that I think they are going to. I'm just saying the option is there. The possibility is there. The potential is still there. So let me focus on that and how the WWE can save WrestleMania 32. You know, it's easy to focus on the people that aren't going to be involved, the things that the WWE won't have. But the, the cupboard isn't entirely bare. The pantry isn't fully empty. I mean, you still have The Undertaker. You know he's going to work a WrestleMania match. He's worked four pay-per-view matches this year. There's no reason he wouldn't show up for WrestleMania. And when an Undertaker match is on a WrestleMania card, that WrestleMania card naturally feels a little bit more important, a little bit more significant, even without the streak anymore. It's still The Undertaker by God. And when you're looking to fill a venue like AT&T Stadium with 100-plus thousand people, it sure helps to have The Undertaker there because he is the man in many ways. He is that pillar of the WWE in many ways. Outside of Vince, you might argue that nobody is the WWE more than The Undertaker is. So you've got that. You've got another legend from the past, another big name with a lot of name recognition, and that's Triple H. You know, he's going to play a critical role. Praise God! I swear on everything again with the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley that this guy is going to play a major role because God, at the end of the day, is going to get his come WrestleMania. He's going to get his big Mania match. And by God, this year, they need him to have that big Mania match. And I trust in him ultimately to come through. I really do. Like him and Sting really came through at WrestleMania 31. I fully expect Triple H, when ch the chips are on the line and you want somebody to help you make it feel like a big show and you need somebody to deliver at the biggest stage of them all, Triple H is on that short list at the very top of people that you're going to count on, people you're going to trust, similar to an undertaker. You know Triple H is going to bring the goods. You know Triple H can deliver. And there's no reason for me to think that in a featured spot at WrestleMania 32, Triple H wouldn't deliver again. He, he seems to always do that come WrestleMania. You still have Brock Lesnar in the fold. You know, you could pick and choose your spot of when you want to bring him back. Maybe the Royal Rumble, bringing him in as a surprise entrant would be the way to go. You, know, you still have Brock Lesnar, a guy with at least some appeal that gets you some mainstream attention. Somebody that will feel a little bit fresh because he's not oversaturated. He's not a watered-down character. He's not overexposed. Anytime you bring him in, it instantly, at least a little bit, freshens up the presentation of the product. So as a result, you've still got Brock Lesnar, along with Triple H, along with The Undertaker, two of these pillars, two of these bedrocks, two of these guys that you can count on to ultimately deliver the goods more often than not at WrestleMania. And then you still have a currently absent John Cena and say what you want about him and feel how you want about him this way. At this point in time, he's one of the few positive things the WWE has going for them heading into that biggest show. 
And when you look at a guy that's been put in so many big spots and in so many featured matches at WrestleMania over the years, if you're the WWE, you have few others that you would trust more to deliver at WrestleMania 32 than John Cena. And frankly, from a fan standpoint, you look at a John Cena and you know that in many ways he represents the modern WrestleManias of the past 8 to 10 years. And as a result, it wouldn't feel like WrestleMania if John Cena wasn't involved. And again, he's been away for a little bit. You can, again, like with Lesnar, you can pick and choose your spot. It will be just a little bit fresher, even if it's for a very small window of time. So you've got The Undertaker. You've got Triple H. You've got John Cena. You've got Brock Lesnar. You still have some of the fundamentals in place for a solid foundation to build a really good WrestleMania 32 show. Throw in the fact that you have the WWE World Heavyweight Championship in the mix. You still got that world title. And while it may feel a little bit of a secondary nature here, you can still make that title feel like a big deal. And you can make it a marquee piece of your event because that title can still mean something. And when you look at the fact that they've also got this venue to work with too, they're going to be in a major media market like Dallas, Texas, in a huge-ass stadium, an AT&T stadium, that magnificent shrine to Jerry Jones's ego, they can fit 100-plus thousand people into that venue. That's going to make the show instantly feel bigger. That's going to instantly ramp up the expectations internally with the WWE at a time where they seem to be incredibly complacent. They know, ultimately, that they won't be able to afford complacency. They know that it's going to be a statement event. It needs to be, it has to be, and it will be one way or another. And as a result, they're going to put the chips on the line, and they're going to go all in, and they're not going to have assets. At least in terms of the setup, and at least in terms of the resources that they invest into making the show look as good as they possibly can. So you've got those things going for you. And even with that being said, you know, while, yes, they might not have The Rock or Stone Cold or Ronda Rousey or Batista or Sting, there's been plenty of other WrestleManias that haven't sucked, that haven't had any of those guys involved. So who's to say that the WWE can't hit a home run again with WrestleMania 32 with none of these people being involved? You know, yes, it sucks. There probably won't be a Daniel Bryan there. That would be one potential solution to a problem. You know, CM Punk, forget about it. He ain't there. You know, Seth Rollins is injured, so it sucks the guy that they invested a lot of money in 2015. He, he's not going to be there. But is that really necessarily that huge of a loss? I don't know. Randy Orton, they've invested a lot in him over the years, but he's not going to be there. Is that really that much of a loss? Honestly, I don't think so. You know, Daniel Bryan's been gone so long that you, you might notice that he's gone, but does it really make that much of a difference? Seth Rollins? Does it really make that too much of an impact? He's not there. Randy Orton, same thing. You know, a lot of these other guys, Stone Cold, he probably anticipated he wasn't going to be there anyways. Batista, he probably anticipated he wasn't going to be there anyways. Yeah, maybe we had thoughts of Sting versus Undertaker and The Rock versus Triple H and what have you. Maybe people wanted to see Ronda Rousey versus Stephanie McMahon. Yeah, but this show can still survive without all of that. You know, what do they need to do, though? They need to make sure that every match that they have on this card counts, especially knowing the WWE with a four-hour event, the ridiculousness of them. They're probably only going to have eight matches. They need to make sure damn good and well that every single match has a purpose, every single match has a reason, every single match has some type of hook that can get you invested in it, and then make sure that those performers actually deliver on the biggest stage of them all. You could definitely use some celebrity involvement one way to help fill the void, of all the people that aren't going to be there, is find some different people that are going to be there. You're going to be in Dallas, so maybe figure out a way to get Mark Cuban involved. You know, it wouldn't hurt. He's been involved before. Why not get him involved here? You know, getting Jerry Jones involved might be asking a little bit too much. God bless him. Uh, you know, you're looking for a musical performer, somebody that could probably be worthy of a big venue like that, that people wouldn't totally thumbs their nose at, might be a Dallas area guy in Usher. Just throwing it out there, even if he's only involved for that performance. You know, if you want to sit there and really go for the gusto, bring in somebody like a Jimmy Fallon from The Tonight Show. Does it hurt? It's worth a shot. I mean, they got to find some type of big celebrity involvement here, I, I have to concede, because this is an event that needs something like that. Bring in a Snoop, because you can just bring in Snoop. You've seen what he's done over the years, and it seems like when he's involved with something, it's interesting from a WWE standpoint. At the end of the day, it's fucking Snoop. Do you really need any other reason than the fact it's fucking Snoop to bring Snoop in? I mean, you've got to have something for the white people, too. And Snoop is that man. 
Snoop is that man. He's there for all the people. The white, the black, everybody loves Snoop. So having him involved is a big deal, especially for white America, because just like Peyton Manning is black America's quarterback, Snoop Dogg is white America's rapper. Don't ever get it twisted. But when we get to the real purpose of this, is talking about the actual show itself and how the company can still have this show matter and still knock it out of the park. It might not be a grand slam, but a home run can still be a home run and still be incredibly effective. And I think they can still have the potential to deliver a home run here. They need to make sure that that set is absolutely outstanding. They need to do a better job of planning things out this time around in the sense that whereas when they had WrestleMania 31 in Santa Clara at Levi's Stadium, you're having entrances by people like Sting and Bray Wyatt and it's still light outside and you're taking away some of the impact, some of the ambiance of their entrances that they would have because you can't see what's going on with the crowd like you're supposed to. And you maybe won't have that same problem when you're in Dallas at AT&T Stadium, and that's a good thing. You know, it's again, you're going to have the Hall of Fame event that always can help with the impact and the feel of a WrestleMania event. That really kicks off that whole weekend really, really well. And, you know, you could really make something out of that, obviously. But then we get to the actual mass card itself. And this is where it's going to be shit and get time. You've got five, what, five titles to worry about. You know, I look at the tag title situation. You know, you've got the Dudleys in the company. Why not do a TLC tag title match? Do them, the Usos, and the New Day. You have time to make a story out of that. You could throw in the fucking Wyatt family. Who gives a shit about them? We'll find another place for them to lose to somebody on the fucking card anyways. But you want to make this feel big. What better way than to kick off this show with a TLC tag title match with the Dudley Boys, the Usos, and the New Day? You could have the Dudleys win, sure. You could have the Usos win, sure. You could have the New Day win, sure. You could get some type of impact out of any of those three teams winning, and I think having the Dudleys involved, it would be a criminal mistake for this company not to have a TLC tag title match at WrestleMania because of the history, because of the story there. They can still do that type of match, and you've got guys like the Usos and the New Day that could use that type of spotlight that would come from that type of match, kind of signaling that they are going to be the future of the tag team division in the WWE. You look at the Divas title match. To me, you've got to go with Sasha Banks versus Charlotte. Why not at this point in time? I don't want to have anybody else other than Charlotte hold the Divas title at this moment because nobody else is going to have any impact. Why not get to the point where the people really want Sasha Banks and they really want to cheer for her? Why don't you give them a reason to really cheer for her at WrestleMania when you've got her taking on Charlotte for the Divas title? And similar to NXT, you just let them fucking go. You can incorporate Charlotte's dad, Ric Flair, obviously into the mix, and there's a story to be had there. And if we want to get family involved... Fucking Sasha Banks, who she's supposedly related to. Snoop, there you go. Bam, now you've got Snoop in her corner. Can you imagine a promo in the go-home show before WrestleMania where it's Snoop and Ric Flair fucking face-to-face? -face? Now, you have to be careful that they don't become the entire emphasis and focus of it, but does it really fucking matter? Imagine the profile of the Divas title match and how much it's going to be elevated when you're bothering to involve Ric Flair and Snoop into the fucking mix. And now you can have Sasha Banks win the title and everybody celebrates, or you could still have Charlotte retain because she's the dirtiest diva in the game, and then Snoop could do something to Ric Flair afterwards, and everybody fucking wins. And people will be talking about that Divas match as they would potentially anything else on this fucking show. In terms of a U.S. title match, maybe you do like Ryback versus ADR. Give Ryback a featured spot here of some kind, even though I would personally maybe do something a little bit different with him. And in terms of an IC title match, I've heard some rumblings of having uh, Kevin Owens go against Brock Lesnar. No offense to anybody, but are we that fucking stupid? We're going to have Kevin Owens go up against Brock Lesnar. If they've done a better job of building up Kevin Owens and they've better, done a better job of maximizing upon Kevin Owens and doing the right things with Kevin Owens, then that's a different story. But where Kevin Owens isn't appearing or he's not talking to now all of a sudden we're going to throw him into a program with our top baby face and Brock Lesnar is absolutely completely fucking ridiculous. Give me an IC title match between Dean Ambrose and Kevin Owens. Let those two guys have 15 minutes and go tear the fucking house down. Either way, Owens wins the IC title. People are happy. Ambrose wins the IC title. People are really happy, I guess. Either way, 
Nobody really has to choose. They could just enjoy the match. It's that one match, maybe along with Sasha Banks and Charlotte, where everybody could just circle jerk to, and they really don't have to have any allegiances. Now, in terms of some of the old stars that you still have in the mix that you could potentially bring in, I know there's been some talk about maybe Mick Foley wanting to get involved, but he doesn't think they would let him. You know, there's always a space for Foley if the WWE would let him, in my opinion, but I don't think it's going to happen. You could bring in Chris Jericho, and maybe he'll probably end up being involved. But again, do we really have that much interest in Chris Jericho coming back just to lose to somebody at WrestleMania? No. I'd rather bring in somebody else like Goldberg. For a time where the WWE doesn't have a lot of those names from the past, this would be the opportunity to bring in a name from the past that hasn't been overexposed, that hasn't been utilized for years, where you can pick and choose your spot, kind of like with a sniper rifle, and you could say, hey, we can inject Goldberg into WrestleMania 32, and we can help elevate the profile of the show a little bit. Now, granted, I mean, he's not going to be the BL end all, he's not going to be a savior, and you're not expecting him to come in and have a tremendous match, but you need some type of name recognition, some type of star power, something a little different, and Goldberg being in the WWE for the first time in over a decade would at least short term be a little interesting. Now I know a lot of people would instantly point to Ryback versus Goldberg as being the match, and again, if that's what they ended up doing, I don't have a ton of complaints about it, but for me, for my purposes, I'd maybe want to actually have Goldberg go over somebody, so why not throw him up against Rusev? Goldberg versus Rusev, and that way if Goldberg wins, it's not going to really make much of a difference when it comes to Rusev any damn ways. You know, you can throw Rusev out there to be fed to Goldberg. I'd rather have that happen than Ryback be fed out to Goldberg. You know, I don't want to bring Goldberg back just to have him lose that one match at WrestleMania 32. Why not? I mean, you put it right there somewhere in the middle of the show. You know, you bring back Goldberg at the freaking Royal Rumble as a surprise entry, and people are going to notice, and people are going to be excited about that. It's going to feel fucking cool. Everybody will bitch about it beforehand and be like, yeah, it's stupid, and we didn't need Goldberg. And then as soon as he comes out, he's going to be like, Goldberg. Now, granted, we'd probably be even more excited if it was Goldberg versus Rusev, but that's a story for an entirely different time. But see, you look at that undercard, and, I mean, it's not necessarily I'm going to get your rocks off, but I think it's solid. I think it's solid in the way it's put together. I think it's solid in terms of the flexibility of options that you have. And it has the potential to really deliver. But ultimately, to me, WrestleMania 32, it's about three matches and three matches only. It's going to be about Triple H's match. It's going to be about The Undertaker's match. And it's going to be about the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. And no, I don't necessarily put the WWE World Heavyweight Championship in the match with Triple H or The Undertaker. Although... I think you can build a tremendous retirement storyline out of Undertaker going for the title one more time. And there might be a very strong temptation for me there because of the man, because of what he has meant to the company for so many years, because of the event and where it's at and how many people are going to be there, that I would maybe like to do one storyline where I've done it where the old guy is going for one last shot at glory. And if anybody has ever deserved it, it's The Undertaker. I think you could draw a lot of money out of a story of Undertaker chasing the WWE World Heavyweight Championship one more time. But I won't go there with this. Three matches that to me could really deliver. Three matches that to me could really help save WrestleMania 32. Number one, Triple H versus Roman Reigns. This is the match that's been in the offings for a while. This is a match that I've been waiting for the WWE to go to. And this is the match that reeks to me of a WrestleMania match for these two guys. It gives Triple H a big spotlight match. It has a lot of the important elements of WrestleMania revolving around God, which at this point in time, they need to, in part because, again, he is God. Praise God! But more importantly than that, it gives Roman Reigns another feature spotlight match, while at the same time not seeming like you're forcing him down people's throats by having it be telegraphed that he's going to win the title to close out WrestleMania 32 and everybody's pissed. You could go there. And maybe it's time to go there with him winning the title. But I don't necessarily agree with that. I think you accomplish more with Triple H versus Roman Reigns on this card for both people involved, for both characters involved, and for the product overall than if you have Roman Reigns go after the title. Now, some of you might say, well, what if you have Triple H versus Roman Reigns for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship? As always, that could potentially work, especially if God's carrying the belt into the show. But at the end of the day, I think it's better if we keep the belt out of it. We make it a more personal issue. 
Like Triple H and Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 30, the genius of that was that it wasn't for the title. Yes, technically their match was for a shot at the title, but you could believe in it. You felt it. You sensed it. It had a realness to it. It had an organic feeling to it, to where even if they would have only done Triple H versus Daniel Bryan, it was no titles. They didn't put any of that other storyline shit involved. Daniel Bryan Triple H probably still would steal the show in a lot of ways at WrestleMania 30 because of what it meant going into it. You have some of the same components at play, potentially some, with Triple H and Roman Reigns. A match could be a monster, and it could be a really important match for Roman Reigns, and I think it's really important that Triple H knows his role, understands his play, and understand what he needs to do. It's on him. The pressure's on him. And this is his chance to really deliver and help the company both short-term, but more importantly in the long-term, because someday Triple H is going to need guys like Roman Reigns and many others too in order to help keep the company viable. And this is his opportunity to make sure that he helps cement one of those guys in their spot in the future. And yes, while some of you will surely be pissed if Roman Reigns beats anybody at WrestleMania, let alone a Triple H, wouldn't you at least be happy if it wasn't for the damn title, especially if the story was good? Would you be that opposed to having a Roman Reigns go over a Triple H? Now, in terms of the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, you've already had Sheamus cash in at this point in time. Why not have him carry it off to WrestleMania? Especially if you have Brock Lesnar win the Royal Rumble and you have him face off with Sheamus at WrestleMania 32. On the surface, I look at a match between a guy like Brock Lesnar and Sheamus, and from a stylistic standpoint and a visual standpoint, it works for me. And I think it has the potential similar to Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 31 that was surprisingly good in its stiffness and its physicality. I see Brock Lesnar, Sheamus as the same type of match that could feel like a big type of prize fight over the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. And either one of two things, either Sheamus retains the title and you've given a heel a big, huge victory there, and Lesnar's actually put somebody over, or Lesnar goes over here and you've got a future big title match with him and somebody else down the road, maybe at SummerSlam or another pay-per-view, maybe the next month, either him and Sheamus again at Extreme Rules. When I look at the WWE World Heavyweight Championship at this particular moment, I'm okay with Sheamus holding the belt, especially if it means that somebody like a Brock Lesnar wins the Royal Rumble and it's Brock Lesnar versus Sheamus for the title at WrestleMania. I do not think that Roman Reigns versus Sheamus for the title at WrestleMania works all that well. I do think that Roman Reigns Triple H works really well at WrestleMania, especially if Triple H and Roman Reigns are both entered into the Rumble and Triple H ends up eliminating Roman Reigns. Man, then you are off to the fucking races. But when I look at this event, there's one match and one match alone that I think is the main event. There's one match and one match alone that incorporates so many things. Two huge names in a match that you haven't seen in a long time, a match that's never happened at WrestleMania, a match, most importantly of all, that feels worthy of a WrestleMania and feels worthy of a WrestleMania main event. And that, of course, I'm talking about is The Undertaker versus John Cena. Now, I know some of you might sit there and say, well, why would you not sit there and divest your resources a little bit and have Undertaker face somebody else and John Cena face somebody else because then you're using them in two different matches instead of one. Granted, I get it and I understand it, but let's be completely, totally honest. When it comes to WrestleMania 32, I mean, don't, no disrespect, but even Brock Lesnar versus Sheamus for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, just because they have Brock Lesnar involved doesn't mean it's main event WrestleMania worthy. Now, Brock Lesnar, Sheamus, to me, doesn't feel WrestleMania main event worthy. Similar to how Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns, didn't feel WrestleMania main event worthy last year. Triple H versus Roman Reigns has a lot of intrigue there. There's a lot of potential there. They could do a lot of good things there. But again, that doesn't feel WrestleMania main event worthy. The Undertaker versus John Cena does. The modern Mr. WrestleMania in some ways and John Cena in terms of the number of main events and big matches he's had there over the years versus the guy that, sorry, Shawn Michaels apologist, is the real Mr. WrestleMania, the Undertaker. He's been wrestling at WrestleMania since 1990 fucking one and he's still going strong. The son of a bitch won 21 consecutive matches at WrestleMania. And you go into this match, you know, you don't have to worry about this or that or everything else because people are going to boo and cheer Cena like they always have. 
but you clearly know people are going to be behind The Undertaker, and it puts Cena, frankly, in a comfortable position. It would force the WWE to be a little bit creative in terms of how they would build up this story, how they would create the entry. But at the end of the day, you don't really need to do a whole lot. Because for years there's been discussion whether people want to acknowledge it or not. What would happen at WrestleMania? The Undertaker versus John Cena. And most importantly of all, I think, is when you look at the grand picture, is the one thing you don't want to have is a predictable WrestleMania main event as much as you possibly can. Now, sometimes it's unavoidable. I grant you that. But sometimes you could do something different. Like last year, you know, I had the feeling that they were going to go in a different direction. They weren't just going to telegraph having Roman Reigns win it, and they didn't. They went with Seth Rollins cashing in at WrestleMania, and it worked for that show in that moment. That was the right decision at that time. Because they gave you something going forward, but they surprised you, and they caught you off guard. Now we go into Undertaker John Cena. You don't know who the fuck will win that match. Yeah, The Undertaker hardly ever loses at WrestleMania, but he's lost once before to Brock Lesnar. Who's to say he couldn't lose to John Cena? But at the same token, yeah, it's John Cena, and he's a monster, and he's a master politician, but he's no Undertaker. He doesn't have Taker's clout. If John Cena goes to the hospital after a WrestleMania match, Vince is still back in the gorilla position. When The Undertaker has to go to the hospital after his match at WrestleMania 30, Vince leaves his fucking baby. He leaves WrestleMania to go be with The Undertaker in the ambulance. That's how much The Undertaker means. But when you look at this, you know, you could tell a whole coming-of-age story to way back in the day after Cena's first match, and there's Undertaker shaking his hand, going way back to 2003 in that short little cup of coffee program that they had. The main event at back, it was a backlash is Undertaker John Cena. When I look at this match, when I look for something that based off of the components that this company has in play right now, the best option and the only real viable option this company honestly has for a main event for WrestleMania 32 is The Undertaker versus John Cena. And it's that simple. And I would even go a step further if things were set up differently. I might have even made this a title match where you could have Cena drop the strap to Taker in his last match. If you were going to go there, if it was going to be Taker's last match. So often we complain about things being predictable. So often we complain about the same old type of matchups. Well, Undertaker versus John Cena, we could think we would know what the finish is, but we don't really know. So we could be surprised by what happens. It's a fresh matchup, and it features two huge names. And it feels, most importantly of all, worthy of a WrestleMania. And in particular, this WrestleMania. I think the opportunity is right. I think the timing is right because having Undertaker face anybody else on the roster is frankly a waste of time because you got to have Undertaker go over. And frankly, from a John Cena standpoint, having him go up against anybody else on the main roster is also a colossal waste of time because at the end of the day, John Cena has to go over. Well, now you get to Undertaker John Cena, and only one of them can go over, and neither one of them necessarily has to go over. I think it, it opens up for so many potential possibilities that could be really really good now is there a lot of long-term benefit from doing it no but does it necessarily need to have that either no so i'm looking at it this way you give me a tlc tag title match a divas title match with sasha banks and charlotte where you've got snoop and rick flair involved holy christ almighty a couple of solid maybe mid-card title matches like ryback adr ambrose versus owens throw in a goldberg versus rusev have the wyatts and chris jericho losing to somebody on the fucking card i don't care and then you build the show primarily around three core matches triple h versus roman reigns in a grudge match and you could even put some type of special stipulation to it if you so desired and it would probably work you could have a WWE World Heavyweight Championship match with Brock Lesnar taking on Sheamus, with Lesnar being the Rumble winner and Sheamus being the champion, and then The Undertaker, John Cena, to close out the night. You know, to me, that feels like a pretty good WrestleMania. That feels to me like a WrestleMania that has a lot of potential. Would it necessarily go down as one of the all-time great shows? Probably not. But would it, at least, if anything else, feel like a WrestleMania that deserved to draw that type of crowd at AT&T Stadium? Would it feel like a show that was worthy of being called a WrestleMania? And would it create some good positive vibes amongst the fan base and within the company going forward into 2016? I think the answer is yes. It's not perfect, but I think what I've laid out is a pretty good solution for how the WWE can help save WrestleMania 32.